This video is sponsored by Describe. When you play D&D for long enough and use the same monsters for a while, eventually your players will start to figure out what the monsters can do, and that always makes those monsters just a little bit less threatening. Additionally, the math of D&D's monsters is a bit wonky. A lot of them just don't hit right for their supposed challenge rating. And also, unrelated, many teams developing 5e content, including the folks at Wizards of the Coast, have been trying to find the best way to adjust stat blocks for ease of use, especially for monsters that can cast spells. And here to address all of those concerns, and a lot more, is a new MCDM 5th edition monster book, Flea Mortals. That's right, I'm actually reviewing a product that came out Kind of recently. This video isn't sponsored, I just backed their Kickstarter last year because I was excited to check out their approach to 5e's monsters. If you're a fan of my channel, you're probably already familiar with Matt Colville, and if you are, then you'll be able to see his approach coming through very strongly in this book. And I don't just mean his approach to monsters or some of his world building concepts from his homebrew setting, although both are used throughout the book. No, I mean some extremely important approaches the book takes to tackling fundamental concepts in D&D. The authors weren't afraid to question or even challenge some of the base assumptions of the game. And thanks to the sidebars with notes from the designers, it's rarely a mystery what was going through their heads when they were working on these monsters. On the contrary, they want you to know what they were thinking, so you can make the best informed decision about how to deploy these creatures in your own campaign. This book very much follows the same philosophy as Matt's YouTube videos, where he doesn't just tell you what you should do. In fact, he often doesn't seem to mind one way or the other if you do what he suggests or not. Instead, his priority is to give you guidance on why he does what he does so you can understand the logic behind his advice and make an informed decision at your own table. And the same rings true for this book. So today we're not just going to flip through a cool monster book, although that would be a ton of fun and once I get my physical copy, you know I'm just going to flip through it constantly. It's a gorgeous book. But today, we're going to take a look at how this book approaches some core concepts of D&D and adapts them, and sometimes challenges or subverts them. Now I should say, I haven't used this product at my table yet, and I don't like to offer reviews for stat blocks I haven't used. And to be clear, I could have been using these monsters for months, but honestly, even though I kickstarted this project and I received the preview packets throughout the development process, I just had no time to sit down and read any of them. It's, it's, been, it's been a heck of a year. And so this is the first time I'm really getting to read much of anything from this product. Now, I'll admit, it's really hard to give an accurate review of a monster book when you can't fairly judge how they play at the table, especially when one of the biggest stated goals of its authors was to make monsters fun to run in combat. But from everything I've heard, these monsters do run really well, and I'm going to start using them in my games soon. So maybe I'll make dedicated videos about these monsters once I use them. That might be fun. In the meantime, for this video, I'll offer my reactions to features of the stat blocks that jump out at me, but keep in mind that I'm only picturing how they might play at the table, not how they do play at the table. Now, as I mentioned, this book was produced via Kickstarter, and the creators documented the process kind of thoroughly, so in one of the uh, videos, or maybe one of the live streams about the project, Matt mentioned that their approach when designing these monsters was to take a look at what made each monster cool and iconic, and use that as their starting point when designing their own versions of these monsters. In other words, their approach was to highlight the same thing that I like to talk about in my often promised and sometimes updated Core Fantasy of Monsters series. They look at what was the most important thing to make the monster work narratively, and then use that to flesh out the lore and the stats. This book is something that I'm going to come back to a lot when I make future installments in that series, because even though I might not always agree on the exact version of a monster's core fantasy that these designers happen to land on, I'll still be able to use their conclusions as a really helpful tool when analyzing these creatures myself. As a perfect example of this approach that the uh, designers are taking, let's look at demons and devils. In the monster manual, devils are described as being lawful evil, and they have their own hierarchy, and there's flavor about them making deals with mortals. Meanwhile, demons are chaotic evil, and there's some flavor about people summoning and binding demons, and some flavor about demons possessing people. Which I don't actually think that they can do. But in Flea Mortals, the flavor for both groups actually gets expanded and turned into mechanics. Many of the devil's names and artwork give them the flavor of court functionaries. A bunch of them are holding out contracts to the camera, and they have powers named after legal or governmental concepts. They're also the ones who now get rules for how to summon them, since it actually makes more sense for your players to potentially summon a devil to get some sort of boon when their backs are against the wall. Meanwhile, the artwork for demons enhances the chaos concept by giving them lots of extra limbs or eyes or skulls. It's grotesque, 
but it really helps set them apart from the orderly nature of devils. In fact, I would encourage you to take this concept further and make these monsters actually asymmetrical. You don't have to actually go that far with that. I'm thinking of creatures like Samael from the first Hellboy movie, whose forearms were different and who also didn't have the same number of eyes on each side of his head. But the other cool thing about MCDM's demons is that they get a new mechanic. They snatch up and feed on souls, and they can use souls to evolve into other demons, like Pokemon. This helps accentuate their role as counterparts to devils who obtain souls through contracts and negotiations. And we can see the same approach used for a bunch of other monsters in this book. Trolls don't just regenerate like they do in the base game, they get hit points back by eating people. There's some cool mechanics in play to help sell the vibe of trolls. I've never been wild about trolls until I started thinking about how to make them lawful evil instead of chaotic evil to better capture the vibe of the bridge troll from folklore. But if you're going to have the ravenous, gross monster that D&D usually uses trolls for, this stat block does a good job of that. And I could go on and list a bunch of other monsters who they nail the core fantasy of, but I honestly want to zero in on one of my favorite sections of the book, the Titans. This is a category with only two stat blocks, Gazamok, who is kind of inspired by the Tarrasque, but far more inspired by Godzilla, and the Kraken. They also named the Phoenix as another Titan, and they say that there are only a few Titans in total, and they're all unique monsters. And this is where I want to highlight the clear influence on these monsters. The way these Titans are described seems like a direct reference to Godzilla and the other Titans from the Legendary Pictures Monsterverse movies. This is a compliment, because even though I haven't seen like half of those movies, just from a distance, I've loved the way that those movies have handled their monsters, treating them as basically a response from the ancient world to the transgressions of man. And somebody who wrote for this book must have agreed with me, because they included this passage. Defenders of all the world. Legends and sages agree that the Titans awaken only when their homeland, their people, or their entire world is threatened. But it's unclear what these godlike creatures view as a threat. They certainly don't seem interested in local politics, tyrants, plagues, or natural disasters. In truth, they await an existential threat powerful enough to destroy the world. That sounds very similar to the flavor of the Titans from those monster pictures. It's also interesting that they took creatures who are generally perceived as a type of monster and turned them into unique Titans, the only one of their kind. But that kind of makes sense. Do you want to run a D&D game where your players encounter a Kraken? Or would it be more fun and more satisfying and more epic for your players to encounter the Kraken? When it comes to the more humanoid races, I don't necessarily agree with all of their approaches to what makes each culture unique or interesting. but I think you can clearly see their ideas coming through in the mechanics in a really cool way, and this is really helpful. For example, kobolds get a gimmick around having shields, which is a cool feature. I don't know if I would say that it lines up with my idea for what makes kobolds fun, but it's not completely incompatible. And honestly, I have kind of a hard time articulating what I think is cool about kobolds. They're kind of a know-it-when-you-see-it kind of thing, and something I'll have to give more thought to before I try to articulate it. Another funny example is that the MCDM orcs have visible veins that glow red or orange, and glow brighter when they're angry. Now this seems like a strange thing to add, but I suspect this was introduced to offer a diegetic explanation for their relentless ability, where they have some internal rage that keeps them at one hit point when they would otherwise drop to zero. That's just speculation, but it makes sense to me. Basically, they must have figured that the orc rage and relentlessness are kind of the big things that separate orcs from other humanoids, so they found a way to justify those in the fiction without defaulting to descriptions of orcs as brutal savages, which I can certainly appreciate. It's not precisely the narrative that I might have come up with, but again, I'm not sure what I would have come up with, so I can't argue that it is definitely a decent solution to that dilemma. On the flip side, the new Null lore is really cool. I won't give it away here, but it's similar to their connection to Yunagu in the pre-existing canon, but also not exactly the same. I also like the sidebar suggesting gnolls can be wild, reckless monsters, or calculating strategists. That's a very cool detail to add some versatility to what I always think of as basically a rabid horde. I'm not wild about the descriptions about the goblins. Like, they're fine, they just don't really seem to challenge the classic ideas of a goblin. But the hobgoblin section includes this passage. Like other humanoids, hobgoblins have no special inclination toward conquest, battle, or cruelty, and they can be found in all walks of life. But when the wicked among them fall on desperate times, some use their talents for the violence and subjugation of others. We've been discussing this concept a lot, I made a whole other video about the ways that you can take creatures like hobgoblins, and illustrate that they're not all just evil because your villains are hobgoblins, so I really like this inclusion. And the final humanoid race I want to talk about from this book is the human. Because y'all, humans actually get an entry. And so not only do we get the book's recommendation for what sort of roles the authors think humans should play in a D&D world, but we can also use this entry as a comparison for how other creatures are described. For example, sure, there's a lot in the Hobgoblin section about how bloodthirsty they can be, but here we get like five straight paragraphs full of different kinds of justifications you can use to have a human enemy in your game, which is not only helpful to inspire human villains, but is also a helpful contrast to show that 
hobgoblins don't have to be inherently any more evil than humans. However, all the human NPCs have an ability where they get advantage on their attack rolls. And that's super interesting. And I honestly wonder if this is in here just as an incentive to use human stat blocks and create human villains. We know Matt Colville loves to run games where humans are the bad guys, and we know that the only human enemies in the Wizards of the Coast monster manual are NPCs. So clearly the original 5e designers didn't think it was important to put humans in the monster manual in the same format as they would for, like, hobgoblins and gnolls. So it seems like this book is providing some incentive to use specifically human enemies as a way to help inspire you to run a game that has human bad guys and not just bad guys from other cultures. And that is such a smart way to do that. It honestly never would have occurred to me. Now, the tricky thing about D&D is that many of these monsters originally come from fantasy or folklore. And because of that, there are a lot of other factors floating around in our heads when we talk about them. And D&D sometimes struggles to represent those ideas in the game. For example, one such creature that I think about all the time is the Hydra. Thanks to pop culture osmosis, we all know how you kill a Hydra. Well, there might be a few different ways, but we know how you don't. You don't kill a Hydra by just cutting off its heads and leaving it at that. And besides, in 5e, it's actually really hard to declare you're cutting off a monster's head unless you have something special, like a Vorpal Sword. So already, a Hydra would be a tough monster to adapt. But the designers of 5e still wanted to capture the fantasy of cutting off a Hydra's head and having multiple heads regrow because that's what makes a Hydra a Hydra. But players wouldn't cut off a Hydra's head, even if they could, because they know better. But they also can't because that's not how the game works. So the designer's solution in the Monster Manual is just to declare that every time a Hydra takes at least 25 damage in a turn, it loses a head, and then it grows two heads back at the end of its own turn. Did you cast Fireball? One of its heads blew up. Cast a Blight on it? The necrotic damage withered a head into a skull. Shot it with an arrow? You pierced through its neck and its head fell off. It's such a terrible solution, and I think it's the worst example in the base game, but it's a useful example of the challenge game designers have to resolve when they adapt monsters who are already famous outside of the game. How do you make them feel like the creatures we're already familiar with? Well, one excellent example, if a bit of an extreme approach, is the way this book handles dragons. How do they sell the impact a dragon is supposed to have? Very simply, the book offers no minor dragons, just five high-level boss fights. And this is summarized really well in the sidebar from the designers. Campaign Bosses We made the choice to give you five serious ancient worms in this book instead of a greater number of unremarkable dragon stat blocks because every dragon battle should be memorable. Each dragon presented here can serve as the villain at the end of a campaign. Of course, some industrious GMs will find a way to tie all the dragons into their story. Yes, that is a friendly challenge. But okay, you can't just omit monsters to bring every kind of monster closer to its core fantasy from folklore. So how about another example? The Basilisk. First of all, in this book's flavor text, the victims are still conscious and aware when they're turned to stone, which is just horrifying. And their petrification can be cured by using chemicals from inside the basilisk's guts, which is also true in the monster manual, but in this case, it's actually part of the creature's stat block. I also think this is a direct reference to the basilisks that appeared in a game Matt Colville played in. He's talked about that on his channel before. But the biggest, most significant change comes in the form of the Basilisk's gaze. In the Monster Manual, you have to choose between looking at the Basilisk and potentially turning to stone, or averting your gaze and attacking at disadvantage. It's a completely passive ability that can affect literally everyone in the party. And while there's a logic to a power like this in a game where it doesn't matter what direction your characters are facing, it can still frustrate players who take a position behind the Basilisk to avoid their gaze and still have to choose between rolling against petrification, or rolling attacks at disadvantage. So in Flea Mortals, it's an attack the Basilisk makes on its turn, which is much cleaner. But it's also not the only action it can take on its turn, and it can target one or two creatures, so it's still appropriately nasty. They also filled the Basilisk with poison gas and poison blood, so it's a threat in some other useful ways as well. Speaking of creatures that can turn you to stone, I want to call out a great change in the description of the Medusa. In the Monster Manual's flavor text, Medusas were vain creatures who were punished for their vanity. That's gone in this version. They don't all value beauty and adoration. The designers left in the detail that Medusas were just individuals who were cursed by the gods, since that's from the original myth. But here, there's also a lot of detail about how Medusas might be good or might be evil, depending on what they did to provoke the curse from the gods, and how they responded to their curse when it took hold. This is a nice compromise between the needs of an action game where you fight monsters and the modern reevaluation of the victim blaming narrative of the original Medusa myth. Speaking of monsters who used to be people, hags are now mortals who made a deal for immortality with an unseely archfey. I can see the connection to stories like the women who go off into the forest with a mentor to learn witchcraft, so I don't hate it, but I'll need to sleep on it. I love hags so much and I have so many ideas for what makes them cool and this doesn't doesn't break those ideas, but it is complicated. In my own games, I might borrow part of this idea and fold in other concepts. Uh, but that being said, I really enjoy that the named hag stat block, Strigonona, 
has just enough weird fairy tale energy around her to capture the folklore vibe. For example, she has three forms most people have seen her in, and they are as follows. Many swear she's a massive woman with claws of rusted iron. Others say she's a cat who steals the souls of the sleeping, and some describe her as a beautiful woman cooking tender meat pies. That feels like folklore in a way that really does it for me. Along these same lines, as we're talking about people who became immortal monsters, the undead section actually captures this folklore idea with my favorite flavor text quote from a fictional character in the entire book. See, for a bit of context, white is an old English word that just meant a living person. But thanks to the fantasy genre, it became a term for immortal beings, and eventually for undead, thanks in no small part to the original versions of D&D. &D. Honestly, the folks making D&D just needed a lot of monsters, so every synonym for a similar creature just became a new kind of creature. But here, not only is this original definition acknowledged, but it's also given a diegetic explanation. It's an old goal word that used to mean person. They remember who they were, and they hate the living, and hate being dead. They remind us of us, so we call them people in an old language. That's such a cool explanation, I really like it. While we're talking undead, the Lich Phylactery gets a new name, the Soul Stone. This is a good change because phylactery is a term from Jewish tradition, and it's something that seems kind of important to that faith. Plus, it's not remotely the same thing as a Lich's soul container, though you probably already guessed that. So even if it were okay that it was cultural appropriation, which I can't dictate that, but it's also just inaccurate. We also get some details about the heartbreaking ritual required to become a Lich, and yes, that is a pun. Thanks to the ritual's requirements, Liches all have a hole in their ribs and no heart in their chest, which is cool. Also, this is actually a major change. The Soul Stone works differently. The Lich doesn't just reform automatically, they linger in the stone until somebody touches it. This means you could defeat a Lich and it could not return for ages depending on how well their Soul Stone was hidden. But the moment somebody sees the Soul Stone, the stone starts trying to draw them toward it. And if someone touches it, that person might take a bunch of damage. But either way, the Lich will escape. It's very cool. It's a very cool game mechanic for something that feels like it's straight out of fantasy. Giants get a real glow up as well. Fire giants give off fire damage just for touching them, and they can do other cool fire-related things like teleport in a burst of flame. Frost giants are surrounded by a storm that disrupts your concentration. Stone giants are made of different types of stone, but they all have flesh that breaks your weapon if you roll a natural one to hit. But it's actually the lowly hill giants who get my favorite feature. They're supposed to be the big dumb brutes. That's the fantasy. So they have a feature called Distracted, where you can use your reaction to make them attack you instead. I also love this sidebar about the feature. Make players aware. The Hill Giant's distracted trait gives the player characters an opportunity to have some fun and engage in, hey over here, tactics. But the players only get to have that fun if they know how the trait works, so be sure to share it with them. I think this might be what the designers meant when they talked about how these monsters were fun to run. Specifically, the book is not hiding the best tactics. And I don't just mean the tactics you can take to have a brutal or lethal encounter, but also tactics to run an encounter where the player's fun is prioritized. But how else do these designers make the monsters fun to run? Well, ultimately, this mandate takes a lot of different forms, some of which I expected, like more interesting powers and abilities, but there were other approaches to this goal that really surprised me. The book includes a bunch of sidebars intended to show you the thought process behind the design, and they are absolutely terrific. Most of them either explain how certain concepts help achieve game balance, or others just say some version of, you might be thinking, why didn't we do it this way? And the answer is because that would not be fun for your players. And by not only keeping that philosophy in mind when writing the book, but also reminding the GM of that philosophy throughout the text, this sends a really helpful signal to GMs to also keep their own priorities in order. Nobody is saying that you can't run a challenging game where death is around every corner, but you want to make sure to remember that your priority is for the players to have fun, not to punish them. Along the same lines, there are content warnings before certain lore or stat blocks to prepare you and your players for potentially troubling material. Because... You know, there are some horror concepts tied into some monsters that just might be upsetting for some of your players, and you need to know that. The stat blocks are also just easier to read. The book uses the term save ends to save a ton of space, and includes a blurb in the intro about the unusual needs of monsters, so if you see certain terms, you know to flip to the front of the book for their definition. Plus, they found a pretty good solution for the spellcasting stat block problem, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. The book also gives some useful encounter building rules. These were co-written by Mike Shea from the Sly Flourish blog and YouTube channel, and he has a ton of strong opinions about combat and challenge rating and encounter design. So combined with the rigorous playtesting MCDM does, I have full confidence in these encounter building rules. I'm happy to try them out soon, and I'm really looking forward to that day. Another very interesting monster is the Lightbender. It's a spin on the Displacer Beast, which is not in the system reference document, so they basically had to build their own version from scratch. But obviously the Lightbender has a very different vibe, you can tell that just by looking at the art. But also, their signature power is noticeably different. Instead of an always-on effect that resumes at the start of their turn and gives everyone disadvantage until somebody lands a hit and then resets on their turn, 
Instead, they have a reaction that allows them to teleport 30 feet away and reveal that the target you hit was just an illusion. Which, funnily enough, is closer to how the Displacer Beast operated in the D&D movie. And this is all, honestly, so, so much easier to use at the table. Rather than trying to remember who's attacked it and when and which attack landed and how long ago and whether people still have the disadvantage to attack or not, this power is so much easier to explain. Plus, you can make the magic item out of the Lightbender's pelt, much like the Cloak of Displacement, though because the Lightbender's power just works a little bit differently, the mantle of the Lightbender is also not as powerful, so it's a lower rarity. But again, this magic item would be so much easier to keep track of during combat and during gameplay for all the same reasons. So once again, it just makes for a smoother experience at the table. Speaking of magic items, a lot of the sentient humanoid monsters also come with a list of potential magic items that they might have. Specifically, magic items that would make sense for these creatures to use because they enhance what makes this monster cool and good. I also love, love, love that their answer to the seemingly endless question, can a druid wild shape into an owlbear, or its less famous sibling question, can you polymorph into an owlbear, isn't just no rules are more important than fun, but it's also not just yes rule of cool. It's yes, rule of cool, but here's the recommendation for which traits to change for the player version to improve game balance. Another cool thing this book does is classify monsters with different roles. Ambusher, artillery, brute, controller, leader, minion, skirmisher, solo, support. And you know what's interesting? This is almost exactly the same list of roles from 4th edition. And speaking from experience, those categories made building encounters in 4e so much easier. You can use these roles as guidelines to make sure your fights are more interesting. For example, I often forget to include any creatures who are intended to act as artillery or as controllers, but with this book's guidance, I can not only remember to include them, but their role will help me better deploy them on the battlefield, which helps guide them to act more tactically in combat. Additionally, using those creatures might actually change the way I design the battlefield to give different roles a chance to shine. And doing that helps shape the battle in a way that demands more creativity on the part of the heroes. So yeah, these roles are awesome for making your games more fun in lots of different ways. And the best example of that is the minion. Now, in 4th edition, minions were monsters that just had one hit point, and that's all you really needed to do. That spoke for itself in that version of the game. 5e is a very different game with very different needs, so these designers spent a lot of time finessing these rules so you can still get the effect of a one hit point monster, but without making it possible to cheese all these minions even if they succeed on the saving throw for an AoE spell. There are also some cool game mechanics like uh, overkill damage, where you can carve through multiple minions at once. But honestly, my favorite innovations here are the group attacks and the group saving throws. There's such a smart solution to the situation that so many of us find ourselves in when we throw a huge horde of monsters at the players. As these skeletons gang up on you, am I seriously going to roll 12 attack rolls? Am I literally going to roll a saving throw for every one of these 15 scarecrows? Sure, we can abstract these things, but honestly, it's also nice to have a simple mechanic to take care of the work at your table. I'm stealing this mechanic immediately. Speaking of simplifying mechanics, over the past couple of years, there's been a big push from Wizards of the Coast and other 5e publishers to find smoother ways to put information into stat blocks, particularly when it comes to spells. For Game Master, it can be a real challenge to flip between stat blocks and spells, especially when trying to figure out what spell the monster should cast. Even when using a digital toolset like D&D Beyond, it would still be nice to have the effects of the spell represented in the stat block instead of showing up as a link to another page. Now, 5e has been moving in that direction already, but Flea Mortals takes an approach to spells that is even cleaner. Yes, each stat block for the spellcaster has some powers that take the place of spells, but those powers are also labeled with the level of the spell this power is meant to simulate. Which means if somebody counterspells your magic user, you've actually got the tools you need to figure out how it would work. I hope Wizards of the Coast does this in their next monster manual, because it is so smart. Additionally, these spellcasting stat blocks still include a list of utility spells, so if you want, you can look up those spells and cast them in the game, and it actually makes sense that they would have these spells, but it's also unlikely that these spells will be used in combat, so looking them up really shouldn't slow down your game that much. Also in this book, monsters can cast multiple spells or spell equivalent powers per turn, because it's a game, and monsters need to be able to live longer. It seems like a pretty extreme change, but given how much they've playtested these, I'm excited to give these spellcasting monsters a spin in my own games. Now, in addition to just offering a bunch of monster stat blocks in different categories, they also offer a souped-up version of the monster to act as basically a ready-made villain you can just drop into your game. I love the backstory and setup for the Hobgoblin villain, Bloodlord Varix. Hobgoblins are linked to devils and demons, and Varix is being sponsored by devils to prepare to take his army across the plains. I especially like how you could use him and or his army as a villain at any point in the campaign. At early levels, maybe you're trying to prevent him from building up his army. At higher levels, maybe the army is formed and they're just beginning their raids. Or maybe they are already a full-fledged scourge of the multiverse, invading the plains and inflicting strife on the cosmos. On the flip side, I really like that the example of the orc villain stat block is not necessarily an enemy. He's a shrewd mercenary. He's not like, 
a good dude, but there's a lot of interesting stories you could tell with him, and he might not always be the antagonist. Now, briefly, I want to talk about the format of modern monster books. Listen, I know it's not easy to format a D&D book. Like, case in point, the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide is so poorly organized that it's being used as the justification for rewriting and reprinting the entire book. And honestly, that's a good thing. That book needs a little bit of work. But in the lead-up to publishing their 2024 rules refresh, Wizards of the Coast has begun to share their approach for formatting the new monster manual. And again, I've never laid out a tabletop game supplement, but what they're describing sounds pretty bad. They're planning to decouple some monsters from their groups, so each individual demon and devil will be placed alphabetically into the book. For example, the Merileth won't be grouped among the demons, and she'll be listed under M. Now, I come from 4th edition, where all the monsters were coupled together by category. Even the goblins, hobgoblins, and bugbears were all in one section together, to reflect the fact that they all work together as goblinoids. And while, I'll admit you, you probably don't need to go that far, I do think there's an advantage to grouping monsters together in ways that actually make sense for game masters when they are trying to find these monsters. Which, look, I don't want to be prematurely negative, and I don't like to dunk on Wizards of the Coast for no reason, but the layout of the new monster manual sounds miserable. So how does Flea Mortals tackle this same organizational issue? Well, first, there is a chart in the introduction that lists all of the creatures by challenge rating, which unbelievably is not one of the lists in the 2014 Monster Manual. But also, in this book, it's not a list, it's a chart. Why does that matter? Because you can look at this list of CR2 or CR4 or CR10 monsters, and at a glance you can see what type of role they fill in combat, what type of creature they are, humanoid, monstrosity, undead, fey, etc., and most importantly, what section they're in. See, this book has a bunch of different types of goblins in the goblin section, but also, it has monsters that might accompany them, like a, as mounts and the like. The devils and demons each get a section. Each type of undead is in one section, though it's also got some useful subdivisions for ease of use. Plus, some monsters are relegated to the environments chapter rather than taking up page space in the main book. And giving you this chart cuts down on so much of the confusion and makes this book much easier to use. Now here's something cool. Some of the most iconic D&D monsters, particularly the humanoid monsters like goblins and hobgoblins and orcs, get these really cool splash pages at the start of their sections. The Cobalt's opening image is probably my favorite piece of art in the entire book. But overall, the art in the book can actually really help sell the core fantasy the designers are going for. With the Gith replacements and the Illithid replacements, the book steers further into sci-fi fantasy, but in a way that kind of works. The Gith are subbed out for the Time Raiders, and maybe it's the four arms or how they're dressed, but they feel like they're straight out of pulp setting, like a John Carter of Mars type thing. And similarly, the Mind Flayers become the voiceless talkers, and while what we're seeing is clearly a bit more sci-fi than the Mind Flayers already are, I don't know how else to explain this other than I think they threaded the needle just right for my sensibilities. I was actually pretty worried about how both of these would be adapted, because Matt Colville said in his videos that no, these were not going to be sci-fi concepts, but they would be like about as sci-fi as Star Wars is. And I still didn't know if they were going to get it right or go too far past the point where I think typical D&D works best. And honestly, they kind of did for the Valok. These guys don't do that much for me. Although they do get points for these two Servok pieces of art that look like they should be the toys for a kids-friendly animated spin-off of the original Battlestar Galactica series. But the Time Raiders and the Voiceless Talkers, I think they feel just pulp enough that I would feel no issues about using them at my table without worrying about sliding into a sci-fi campaign without meaning to. And in all fairness, it is really tough to describe sci-fi concepts or even space fantasy concepts in a fantasy pulp game like D&D. I mean, even if you're just playing a straight-up fantasy game or a hardline sci-fi game, it can be hard to describe things the way you want to. It would be nice to have access to a team of writers who could find the words to describe things in the ways that you can't. Especially if they were, say, multiple any award winners for best online content in 2021 and best digital aid in 2023. And if they had literally thousands of scenes describing monsters and magic items and NPCs and locations. And if they were to have a huge collection of fantasy scenes and a new and growing list of sci-fi scenes. And if they were called Describe and they were offering a discount code to the viewers of this channel. Like if you visited Describe.com slash Supergeek and use the promo code Supergeek at checkout and you could save 10% off your first subscription payment. Oh hey, when you know, this video is sponsored by Describe, the any award winning website with thousands of fantasy and sci-fi scenes and they are offering a discount to the viewers of this channel. Well, the wild coincidence, I was just thinking about that. I was like, oh, it would be nice if this thing existed. And then I was like, oh, wait, no, it, it actually, never mind. It does exist. That's that's kind of cool. Once again, that's dscryb.com slash supergeek and use the promo code supergeek. Thanks so much to Describe for sponsoring the channel. There are also some awesome things in this book that I'm just not going to have time to cover in this video. 
For example, nearly every sentient monster has a retainer version, in case you get a retainer, like the kind that you can obtain in the MCDM book Strongholds and Followers. This is somebody who pledges their loyalty to one or all the party members. And nearly every unintelligent monster has a companion version, in case you recruit one to be your pet or your animal companion, which you could even do as the uh, MCDM class, the Beast Heart. Both of those are products I plan to talk about in the future, so I might revisit some of these stat blocks at a later point. But also, you don't need to have a Beast Heart player to uh, take advantage of the monster's companion stat blocks or have a keep to get a retainer. As we're all probably intimately aware, players will try to adopt any monster they find, so these stat blocks are still really useful. There's also an entire chapter of environments, like road, forest, graveyard, sewer, ruined castle, that kind of thing. In addition to giving you a sample map and some actions or traits you can give to any monster to make them better fit that location, they also offer some monsters that are unique to each setting. And most of these seem to be completely original MCDM monsters that aren't based off of any stuff from the 5e monster manual, like a lot of the stuff in the bulk of the book is. Now that's not true across the board. The Onkeg is in this section, and the Ashen Hoarder reminds me a lot of the Cadaver Collector, which is an Eberron thing that I think I remember seeing in a, one of the 4th edition monster manuals. But honestly, from what I can tell, a lot of these things are original. Or if they're not, and they are inspired by existing monsters from Wizards of the Coast publications, I certainly don't recognize most of them. I'm not going to have time to dig into this chapter very much, but my favorite environment-specific monster is the Bread Beetle. It's a very interesting headless giant that you can encounter on the road, and has a ton of very cool story potential as a random encounter, a major enemy, or even an ally. This book also has some of MCDM's approaches to psionics, which recently appeared also in the uh, 5e class, The Talent. But you don't need the talent to use the psionic monsters. This book includes some psionic powers at the end, uh, all on their own. But honestly, the main thing that I won't have time to cover today are the villain parties, which takes up the entirety of chapter 3. At the back of the book, there are seven enemy adventuring groups that you can throw at a party, each of a different level. But this section also has some really useful mechanics for groups of enemies, as well as just providing some excellent advice for running different types of villains, including slowly introducing an enemy party in a dramatic way. I am definitely going to have to make a whole video in my villains series where I just dive into chapter 3 of this book, because it's kind of a goldmine. But hopefully this video has done a good job of demonstrating what I think works about this book. It's clear that they're tackling 5e with a name to solve some of the same problems that I've been wondering about for a while now, even if I haven't been able to articulate some of these issues myself. And I'm really excited to return to this book over and over again, and use it to continue to enhance and improve my D&D games for the next several years. I have a feeling you can count on this book to make many, many appearances in future videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. If you like the video and you want to see more like it, then subscribe and ring the bell for more. If you want to help this channel grow, then sign up for my Patreon. Uh, if you want to hang out with other awesome people, then you should check out my Discord server. That's full of awesome people. And I've got a newsletter if you want to know more about what I've got going on. All those links are in the doobly-doo below. The MCDM writers threw down the gauntlet inviting you to run a campaign with all five of their big boss dragons in it, so if you want to see an example of what that might look like, check out my Critical Role Demystified series, where we break down lessons from Matt Mercer's D&D game. Even if you have no interest in Critical Role at all, these videos are a terrific resource for game masters and for players, so check them out. Until next time, play fair, and have fun.